Hi, everybody. It's the A to Z podcast. I'm Zach Jackson. I'll be joined in a minute by my partner, Andre Knott. We're at facebook.com slash A to Z podcast. A to Z podcast.com is where you go for old episodes. Uh, if you have an iPhone, click that fancy purple podcast button, subscribe, download, leave a review, all of that stuff. We appreciate you guys who've been listening for years. We appreciate you new listeners and all the feedback um, we get shout out as always to our sponsors. That's the Honeymoon Grill in the Portage Lakes, Cleveland Scene, and to American Fireworks. American Fireworks just wrapped up demo days uh, last weekend. They have a lot of good sales going on. They're always open at AmericanFireworks.com. And if you go to the store in Hudson, the rumor is if you tell them A to Z sent you, they take care of you a little bit more than they already would. So as I mentioned, Audrey would be here in a minute. Um, for you longtime listeners, you'll really get a kick out of this. We recorded a podcast. Um, it was great. We had it scheduled. He was only like 40 minutes late rather than the normal 50 to 170. We were raring to go. Um, and you're going to hear most of it in a minute. But what happened is as I was getting ready, I accidentally knocked the microphone out. And for about the first 10 to 12 minutes, I didn't realize it. So I was able to save most of it. Uh, but the other part was too echoey and a mess because I was talking into a non-microphone. So all you really missed, um, other than frankly, I thought we did a really natural segue with getting the sponsors in, talking American Fireworks. He only talked over me two or three times. Um, But we talked about Kevin Love and the incident Monday night in Toronto. Um, He's he's really mad about it, but we'll get to that later. This was always going to be the NFL draft pod. So hope you had a chuckle at my, um, I wouldn't even say lack of technological savvy, just being an idiot and not triple checking um, that the mic was actually still plugged in when I guess in retrospect I should have known that um, my elbow kicked it off. But anyway, we're going to pick up in mid-conversation, and this will be another normal A to Z podcast. Well, as normal as an A to Z podcast could ever be. There's no matter what your job is or what your gig is. Um, it's taken a little bit to get back to. I- I'll say this for you. I have a feeling that the NFL season will be as normal as it's ever been. I feel I hope that media wise they let you got you guys get back to going in. I don't even I don't even know. Maybe you won't. I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But I would like to think that you guys will cover football and football games will look like they did pre twenty twenty, um, come this August, come this September. It's a little bit more when and you know, like like on one hand, you you never had to put pants on. You got to wear sweatpants all season long and do it Zoom calls, which drove us insane. But to do the job the way you know you need to do the job, you know you need to be in Berea. You need to be in Baltimore. You I've never be- felt more distant from a team right. that I've covered, right? Right. And that's not to say that guys in the locker room are, are always giving you dirt, right? Or that you can take the temperature by being in an open locker room for 35 minutes a day or being at the games. But over the course of the year, that, that adds up, right? Um, right. Yeah, I've never felt more disconnected. Sure. I, so, yeah. So. It's getting back to, and I mean, I'm still not all the way there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. And I've said that a a million times on this podcast and I will always continue to say that. Um, But it's still not all the way back. Like, I mean, home games, it is great. I sit right next to the team. Um, You know, Jose still smacks me in the back of the head. I still, you know, I hear guys talk like there are elements of my job and elements of, of of knowing the game and being around the game that are, that are unbelievable still to be around, to see, to hear, um, which makes it a lot better. But at the end of the night, I'm still running on a Zoom call uh, to do interviews. So it's getting there, but it's every day. And my kids are a little bit older. I'm chasing. I'm trying to get to all their games, uh, or as, watch as much as I, of their stuff as I can. Um, it's it, it, You know, the six hours of sleep ain't, ain't really feeling like six hours of sleep right now. Then I took that shot the other day, and I'll just tell my half of this side of the story. We both had our shot set up on Thursday. We didn't do it purposely. It's just how life happens. It's our second shot. Some excitement that comes along with that because you feel like you're finally getting over the the threshold. Uh, and for my job, it, it kind of helps to know, like, all right, I'm I'm at that point where um, I can feel a little bit more safe in, in being around and doing the things that I'm doing. And I got it Thursday at, like, noon. And it was the first game of the Yankee series. I came home. I ate something. I, I was, took a bunch of vitamins, drank all the water that they tell you to, you know, to all that, all the, all the stuff they tell you that will help. Um, I go and work the game and I'm fine. I get home Thursday night from the game. I had been texting with you or somebody else. I was fine. And I changed clothes and I kind of sat down like I always do after the game. And I, I had like shorts and like a long sleeve shirt on and I stood up to do something. And I was like, man, I'm cold. And 
like 30 minutes, 40 minutes later, like I didn't even put two and two together. I was like, man, why am I so cold? I had the chills, but didn't think anything of it, anything of it. Probably cracked a beer and drank the beer, then went to sleep. And I woke up and I was, it was hell on earth. <laughs> like I was, I had the chills. I was sweating. I had the worst headache I've ever had in my life. Um, and somehow Friday I ended up going I, I, like for, so for like from eight, I went on a radio at like eight, I think. Yeah. With Wills and Snyder. And I kind of just pushed through. And afterwards I looked at my wife and I was like, I gotta go. I, and I couldn't, sleep. the worst was I couldn't sleep. I had a temperature, all that other stuff, but somehow by like one o'clock after taking a bunch of vitamins and water, took a shower and drug my butt to the park and I was fine. And I've been fine since knock on wood. Thank God. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not a doctor. I, obviously I, I have my thoughts and my home remedies like everybody else does, but I can just tell you this for me, when I don't have an appetite, that's when I know I'm sick. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And if you look like, at us, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's, you know, not uncommon for me to feel a thousand pounds, but like walking up the stairs, I was like, Oh, Oh boy. Like my legs are heavy. You know, insert your own Eminem lyrics here. And uh, <laughs> then the uh, the cold sweats came in anyway. All right. Um, but enough about us old men and yeah. enough about Kevin Love. It's uh, draft week, baby. It is. It is. So what do you got for me? Well, we're in Cleveland, Ohio. and We're based out of Cleveland, Ohio. We last week during this podcast, we basically threw out one of those Andre things he does during podcasts where he's way too nice or he's way too happy in a good mood and realizes that he's really not going to be in that good of a mood after he says something. But this time I'm going to stick to my guns. I told everybody as we were talking about the draft last week, um, Zach has this great thing that he has up at the athletic where he makes his money and, and pays for everything and got out of his mom's basement because of this job where he does ask Jackson asking Jackson. And usually most of the questions are from our friends. And then a couple of you guys join in and tell him how stupid he is or how much they hate, how we, how he spells his name. I thought it would be a good idea to try the Axon Jackson way of doing this on this podcast with the draft here in Cleveland this week. Um, I told people you could get in my DMS and ask the questions that you want about ask Zach about the draft. And we would do them on the podcast. Well, today is the day um, y'all blew up my DMS. Like they've never been blown up before. Uh, I've been sending pictures to Zach for the last week of my DMs and different ones that I have. I'm pretty sure I have them all in front of me. If I don't, I apologize, but I'm going to go through some. I'm going to read some of these, and Zach's going to have to react. And I got to tell you guys something. I have not read any of these to Zach. These are all, so Zach's going to have to answer off the cuff and have to go with it. Um, before we start with the question, Zach, I know that you went to a college uh, or you went to a pro workout. What was it a week ago? Or when was a pro workout you went to Friday? The pro day? Yeah, the pro day. Oh, no, that was like back in March. It was the first yeah, day that of was free agency. Um, I was, there was one more question I was going to ask before. Everybody's falling in love. Some guy, I got to tell you, some guy at the, uh, one of the guys at the Indians game said to me as I was trying to get on the elevator the other day, he was like, who do you think they're going to draft? And I was like, uh, I go Northwestern. Uh, cornerback, and I think knew some of the makers, and he was like, "Oh yeah, that's what Zach put it in the paint." I'm like, "Well, I didn't want to say what Zach said, <laughs> but that's been my answer." Uh, so before we even go into those questions, I'll I'll do the first asking Jackson. Um, as we sit here about one o'clock on Tuesday, about 48 hours or so, 48 plus away, um, is that where you're sitting with what you think the Browns will do? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 if he's there, he makes a lot of. Uh, of sense. Um, Greg, Greg Newsom is who I mean. He's 20 years old, uh, almost 6'1", top tier athletic testing. Obviously went to Northwestern. He's smart. He's the first three and done player in the Pat Fitzgerald era in Northwestern. And what does that mean? It means that he was always really good. And this was always his goal, right? Um, a kid that gave up basketball at a young age because football was going to be his ticket. Because he was going to be, as we've been telling you on this podcast for 10 damn years now, a rare six foot corner instead of a six foot two guard where there's a thousand of those and you got to go to Pitt Greensburg. Teach okay. your sons how to backpedal. Yes. yes. And so from, from my research, um, the only knock on him, he did miss games in every year. And from talking to people around the league, that is the biggest thing with this draft is there's usually a line of progression of getting the medical info rechecking the medical info and knowing you know obviously teams interpret it differently but it you know usually go from scouting guys at the end of the season to scouting guys 
through the bowl games and the all-star games to everyone gets medical info at the combine and then there's a recheck. Well, not all medical info was out there. Some is still trickling in, right? Teams want to know. Teams got one chance to see these guys in person and that was pro day. That was it. You know, they, they left enough gray area in the rules to where uh, Justin Fields and, and um, Trey Lance could get a second pro day, but there was no other exposure. And frankly, Dre, there was a rule that said at the end of these pro days, you're supposed to leave the prospects alone because of social distancing. So, you know, obviously teams are connected to these agents. Teams are connected to Pat Fitzgerald. They're going to find out. I guess what I'm trying to say is I know nothing about the injury. The only way that Greg Newsom doesn't go in the top 26 picks is if there's injury concerns. So, yeah, I just think he makes a lot of sense. Um, and the other reason I'm going to put him atop the list, even though I have no idea, because we're talking about the 26th pick, and you can't control anything that happens in front of you, is the next three guys I would give you all chose to opt out and not play last season. Two of those three would only be one-year producers of any kind at the college level. And I just think with those kind of questions, my lean would be that Andrew Barry and the Browns would pass on those guys at 26. The one I'm talking about is the corner, Caleb Farley. I think if he's still there at 26, that means there's big-time injury stuff on him. And then the, the two defensive ends, uh, Rousseau from Miami and Tryon from Washington. Yeah, Those guys look like freaks. Those guys are freaks. They didn't play last year. Rousseau only played one year of college football, period. Um, Tryon was in the program for three years before he opted out of last year. I just am not sure that the Browns go down that road. Um, I, can let me, You brought up oh – man, you brought up Justin Fields. Quickly, The I don't think we talked about the ep- epilepsy – um, diagnosis that I'm sure most teams knew about before it came out for us to hear, but that's kind of come out since the last time we did a podcast. And I've questioned, and I and I wasn't questioning you, but I had questioned how how these other quarterbacks maybe had taken a step over uh, over him, Justin Fields. Do you think that plays into some teams being a little concerned about him because with epilepsy it could be issues with uh, concussions possibly? Not one ounce. And to go back to our prior conversation before we shifted to the draft, I'm not a doctor. But I just think as you look at Justin Fields' career arc as a quarterback, has this kid not been in the public spotlight since 15? Yeah, no doubt. Like, I do not think that that was a surprise to anyone. And I do think, you know, as it's come out, they have the medical information. Let me ask the question better. Like you said, I don't think it was a surprise. It was a surprise to us maybe out in the outside world. But do you think maybe the talk that's come from teams plays into that? That we had, that because we hadn't heard that part. You know what I mean? We were just kind of um, like, why? Is well, it I would say, back? yeah, I think there's two parts. A, you know, all indications are it's never been an issue. And B, as crazy as this sounds, my interpretation when something like that finally comes out, it's because somebody wants him to drop. Yep. All right, that's that's what I was getting. I mean, at. I'm just I'm just gonna say this. You know, I'm nobody, but like. When I do have scouts and execs and people that I know that will give me five or ten minutes of their time for the draft, just just to make sure, I, you know, I'm not looking for confidential info, in, information as much as I'm looking for um, things that I make sure I'm not going to look like a total dumbass, right? And there are things that they will say to me, even though they know in a million years their name's not going to be attached. I'm not going to go there on that question. I'm not going to answer that. So I just think what does get out is intentional. And that might change now in the last 72 hours in the run-up because because the work is done, and I think teams are just posturing a little bit. But I I just don't think that anything gets out there accidentally um, that people don't want to. Yeah, no. I Can I tell you a great story, though? Yeah, give it to me. I'm not 100% right on that, but this <laughs> is, gosh, five, five-ish years ago. Um, one of these draft websites and. I don't know which one it was, but I, I guess my point is it wasn't ESPN or SI. And this was before The Athletic was involved. So it was, you know, I'm not going to say it's a mom and pop shop. Anybody can have info, but it, it was a, you know, a draft, whatever. Um, had some talk that supposedly in such and such team's war room, uh, this team is picking late in the top 10. And they are down to two guys and momentum is built if they're going to take the receiver rather than, I don't know, the defensive end or the offensive tackle, right? Right, And the thought was this, this, and this, and the head coach has shifted to this, and this is their thinking. So, you know, it's one of a million things that gets out there, and usually these things get tweeted in the morning, and everybody talked about them, and then by the afternoon or certainly the next day, there's something else. 
Well, a friend of mine sends it to me. It was his team. And he says, what can you tell me about this guy? So-and-so, right? And I say, I, you know, I have met him. Um, he goes, well, we, we need to do some background work. Like, hmm. do you know anything about him in terms of where he's from, where he used to work, whatever, because we have to trace this. I said, what's going on? He said, Zach, this is verbatim what was said in our draft room. Wow. <laughs> I mean, if I didn't. This wasn't didn't the Browns. You, this wasn't the Browns. Okay. But I didn't know said, you. I wouldn't believe it. But he I said, believe this it. is verbatim what was said in our draft room. And he said, we are freaking stunned, basically. Um, and so I guess there are exceptions to the rule. But from my experience, um, very little gets out. Yeah. Un- unintentionally yeah it all comes out for a reason all right that, and that, that's a great way of telling that story i'll start off the first question that was sent to us in our a to z podcast asking jackson getting you ready for the 2021 nfl draft if you're going to the draft have fun sounds like it'll be raining bring a poncho um make cleveland proud try not to fight in front of cameras uh, and try not to show your uh, try not to show off exactly how we act uh, when we like to uh, have a few beverages. Uh, and I've seen that the, you people that like those drinks that my partner likes, they they put more alcohol in them. So look out, Portage Lakes, this summer. It's going to be wild and crazy. Vaccinated with 10% alcohol. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, Portage Lakes is going to have about a 10% vaccination rate is what you meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the flags fly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I can't ask the first question because it was a video that was sent along with it. And the video was tremendous and it was asking about sizes of people's, uh, it was, yeah, we'll move on from that one. But that was a good one Grant. Thanks for starting things off with a, with a good kick in the ribs. Um, we'll go to Chris who wants to know, I have a question for you and Zach for your draft pod. It's more of a hindsight question than about this year's. If you guys could change one draft pick for the Browns over the first five years of their return, that could change things uh, for the better going forward. Well, who, what would it be? Just my two cents, Chris Samuels instead of Courtney Brown in 2000. Thank yeah. You. you know, that's, that's a really hard one. It's an interesting one. I mean, the obvious one is you take the trade in 99. You yes. take the Ricky Williams trade and you get all those picks. But it, it's obvious, but it's not obvious because of who was making the draft picks. Well, sure. Um, Chris Samuels to me over Courtney Brown is a little bit unfair because Courtney at the time was like, he had never been hurt in college. Like he was the number one pick, right? Like his own college teammate was more decorated than him, but like from an NFL perspective, he was at, and like you saw in about four games, you saw freaky plays. I mean, this was miles Garrett when miles Garrett was in diapers, right? Well, see, that's what I was going to say that I I understand what, what Chris is saying, because we now know Chris Samuels was a left tackle for what? 12 years, made a ton of money uh, playing for the Washington Redskins. And now his wife's on a housewife show and embarrassed seems every Sunday. Um, and my wife and I sit and watch and laugh at him, and she has no idea that he played football for the Washington Redskins. She just knows that his wife is a complete you-know-what. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some fans will listen to the like that, and some other fans right now are going, Chris Samuels well, is on a housewife? I, I, would say, I would say the big dummy draft in 2001 where, you know, basically the morning of, like the scouts had done the work and said we're, we're taking Richard Seymour or we're making a move, and the morning of the draft, Butch decided to take Gerard Warren. Who? Yeah, that's the Danian Tomlinson draft as well, right? Yes, yes. So that's where I would. That's exact because I'll say this as you were kind of saying about Courtney Brown, and as I'm doing some research for something else that you guys will know about soon. Tim Couch and Courtney Brown are very much the same for me, Zach. I know that's different circumstance and things and such, but in the right organization, if the organization's set up right, I feel like Tim Couch and Courtney Brown end up becoming are being great fun, found found you know they're foundation type players. They just got set up in a place that had no foundation. Yeah, and and that's why, like, it's a great question, but that's why the thing with the draft is it's not just picking the right player. It's about having the fit for the right player. It's about having the room for him to grow. You know, it's about where you are at the time and how guys mesh in. So you, you can't sit here and pretend that those guys weren't there or they weren't on the right track at the time, right? Like. Right. Tim, in his fourth year, finally had a great year. Well, he had a lot better players around him. He was drafted at 21. The guy had never had a playbook in his life, right? (laughs) Like, he was starting to take off, and then he got hurt, you know? So, what if he had LaDainian Tomlinson? What if he had Chris Seen? You you know, everything is different about that whole setup. Um, Great question, though. 
Yeah, it is. Sure. It's interesting, but it's it's one to not. It's just it's like arguing, you know, who's the best running back that you saw come through Northeast Ohio? Well, different eras, different levels of competition, different whatever. I mean, it's not you know I'll have that argument. But like, oh, I love that. I would love to have that. Speaking of, shout out to Brian Williams. We're getting the book to a head coaching job. Um, I don't know if you're still a listener to AZ, but you've made a uh, different point. You've made different parts of Zach and our life enjoyable, and we're going to be rooting for you. <laughs> and we know the games will still be on Saturday afternoons, and we'll show up. We, we'll show up like we always do, uh, waiting for the bands to play the music and trying to get that free pair of LeBron shoes that they've been giving out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm happy for him. And Ricky Powers is my favorite. No offense to none of these other guys. We can go back and forth. We can do that on another podcast. There will be no one better than Ricky Powers at Akron running backs in my life. I That's know. modern. It was in black and white, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Noah Baker. Um, he tweeted us last Wednesday. He says, question for the A to Z about the draft. It says, I read an article in The Athletic this week that talked about how important the final draft before a rookie quarterback got paid was to the sustained success of a team. I already like where this is going. Um, let's assume that this is gospel for the sake of the question. Would that change how the Browns approach this draft as compared to how many people are mocking them to approach it? Most mocks seem to be a win now and in the next few years by focusing on fixing the defense. Interesting to think if the Browns were thinking long term and would draft both offense and defense. I'm sure there are lots of things that factor in that aren't football related. Um, GM keeping his job, believing in the quarterback long term, dealing with the backlash of not doing the obvious thing. Anyway, thought it was an interesting question and was wondering if Z had thoughts. It is an interesting question. Um, it's a complicated one. Uh, you know, the gist of it is sooner or later, Baker's cap numbers go into 30 or 35 mil, right? Um, so you're going to have to sacrifice guys. But the reason I don't think it changes much right now is like, you know, they drafted an offensive lineman last year. Um, they had the backup guards that had to play at various times through that, through the COVID stuff and all the mess. Like, there is a little bit of depth there. So you would love to be able to have 14 picks and know they could all play and bring them in and keep them on the roster and do that. But the realities are, like, you need 16 guys to play on defense every single week. All right, you got to dress eight or nine linemen every single – offensive linemen every single week, and they got to be ready to play. Um the Browns need defensive help right now, and they needed it at premium positions. And so you're going to look at the edge rushers and corners in every draft, and that goes for 32 teams. So, you know, wide receiver to me, they're going to draft a wide receiver because when you look at the room, the only guy who's guaranteed to be on the ro roster in 22 is Donovan Peoples-Jones. Other guys are under contracts, but as we've said before, Odell has zero dead money past 21. Jarvis has very little. You know, not to say they won't restructure them. We don't know what's going to happen. But, yeah, you can look at where you need the reinforcements, and they just need it on defense. I mean, guys, they were so limited personnel-wise last year. And God bless MJ Stewart. He made those interceptions in both Steelers games, and those were huge plays. He is not a guy you want to have to play. He is not a guy that plays in a secondary, you know, on a, on a real contender. So you need to beef up certain spots. They used free agency, they think, really well leadership savvy playmaking Troy Hill and John Johnson you know Ronnie Harrison's under contract for one one more year they think Delbert's going to come back so yeah I think uh, I, the best way I would answer this is at a certain point and they did this last year because they drafted three offensive guys on the last day of the draft and nobody would have seen that coming at a certain point you're just taking the best player Dre and you're looking at that guy in terms of helping your team in 22 and beyond but he has to be able to make the team this year or you've wasted the pick and up front, you're early in this draft, you're looking at defensive help because you're really thin in a lot of spots still. And even where you've gotten better or addressed in free agency or think you're good because Greedy and Delpit are supposedly coming back, you're not deep enough. They do not have a stable of rushers and a stable of corners good enough to win the AFC right now. So that is where you have to go to keep adding to those stables. It's, it's not the be-all, end-all. It's not to say they're, this draft is going to be a home run or even that it needs to be, but you have to look a little bit it right now. You know, in an ideal world, you would get five guys in this draft who help you in 22 and help you immensely and immediately. And like the cutting of Sheldon Richardson and the bumping up of Jordan Elliott, who who did really nothing last year, shows that right. But like, 
you can't just say in the second round, well, this guard's here and Joel's getting old, so we're going to take him. <laughs> no, you, you, you still have to focus a little bit on what you need right now. Yeah, um, a couple of things I want to go off of that. And I'm not going to go too much because we we're got we on a time constraint uh, when we go about doing it. You know, let me ask you this. What do you make out of the Kansas City Chiefs trade with the Baltimore Ravens for Orlando Brown and the Baltimore Ravens getting the first-round pick of the Kansas City Chiefs for that? I think it was – both teams felt painted into a corner. I think the mm-hmm. Ravens knew – that he, they weren't going to be able to re-sign him because of other things, and that's a good reminder, Lamar's contract being one of them. Um, and the Chiefs knew that at their spot they weren't going to get a better player, right? right? I mean, this is a reminder. This was a proven player with NFL genes who had a bad pro day and slipped to the third round. And he right. wanted to play left tackle. You know, whether or not you believe all the stuff about him destined to play left tackle, my dad wanted me to play left tackle. It's not about money. He just wants to play left tackle. Just, you know, Thank you. I don't, so, I don't need to hear all that other crap. Yeah, so <laughs> – I think you just look at it like two smart organizations got together and ideally do I think that the Ravens really wanted to make the Chiefs better? No, but I think it was their best deal for a team um, that that has long played both for the now and a little bit to the future. And these are first world problems. And when you know you're not going to re-sign a guy and you can get something for him. So, so now they get pick 31, Dre. So they can take the best player available in first round. They need offensive line help. They need a safety Mm-hmm. They certainly need receivers, and, but they can take whoever they want in they the need first receivers. round. And then at thirty-one, brother, they, they get, can brother, trade they, out. Wait, wait, and brother, turn they that get receivers. They got a million receivers. They can't. They you got know what, a million trying... receivers, and none of them <laughs> can play. Well, no. Well, they they haven't found the combination that works with Jackson. You know, like the right. best thing that, and this is my opinion, like the best thing that Jackson works with are big tight ends. But now that teams just funnel all their defense in the middle of the field <laughs> and to keep them from running outside, I mean, I think I think Hollywood works for them because you need someone that stretches the field. You need to keep the safety out of the box. Like the Browns, they need a stretch wide receiver, in my opinion. Um, I just think the Ravens, they've got this great running offense, and they got to get a mauler as an offensive line, by the way. Um, you know, that you've let yes. Brown go. There was talk about Villanueva coming over from Pittsburgh, but he's a pass blocker. He's not a, he's not a smash. Yeah, and he's, he's washed and he's yeah. done to be completely I mean, honest. The Steelers have offensive line needs and they haven't re-signed him. That tells you everything you want to know. Yeah, exactly. But so I, I, and you're what you said about Baltimore. And I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm only saying it cause I'm chuckling to myself. Cause haven't they already signed Sammy Watkins? Sammy, I only play 12 games. Yeah, uh, you know, and they know what he is. It's a, he's a big body receiver on a one year deal who, who will play eight games for you. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, but it, I, it was interesting. I was listening to Chico on the way home last night and some guy called in and was like, we need to save all our money up and don't draft anybody and save our money up and play our players. And I was like, I don't want to like wring that guy's neck. Cause I'm driving home. Like, well, listen, Dude, you're the same guy. I, know, I know what's out there. Um, I, and, and a little bit, I think is the, uh, the local draft analyst who actually watches two games a year, who passes along misinformation, the rookie pool only, Costs the Browns about two and a half million in salary cap for this year, so you don't need to save a bunch. Of, I mean, you have to have money to sign your draft picks. Everybody does, right? But like, you're good. Even at nine players, the cap money for this year is is only two and a half million. Um, there's a system that prorates it, and only the top fifty one players count on your cap. So really, after two or three picks, those guys don't crack your top fifty one with their rookie salary because veteran minimums are higher than, than the rookie salary, even when the signing bonus is added in past a certain point in the draft. So you don't, you're not safe. You don't need 11 million in cap room for nine players. You need two and a half million. Thank you for answering that correctly. And thank you for that nice jab that you had. Let's move on to Sam or I believe is his name. He says that a uh, question for the next draft pod with Wyatt Davis being the first Buckeye off the board, who is the – I like this question. Who is the next Buckeye to be drafted in this year's draft? And before you kill my man Sean Wade, um, my girl from Denver with that writes for The Athletic wrote a great article about what he's went through over the last year. Um, the hint, hint, that's what I would say. I'm still a fan of his, uh, but I'm curious what Zach will say. So they, they got rid of Justin Fields, huh? He's, he's not a Buckeye right? anymore? Yeah, good boy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, next question. <laughs> um, yeah, l- look, it's a freak factory, and this is going to be a little bit of a down year because Ohio State's going to get back to dominating the first two rounds of the draft here for about the next five drafts in a row. Um, I, 
I would like to say Sean Wade doesn't go in the top 100, but I know the position that he plays. And, I mean, Damon Arnett went in the first round last year. As far as the actual answer, um, it's either going to be Myers, the center, or it's going to be Pete Warner, I think, the linebacker. And, and I get, there has been Warner. some talk that Browning, the linebacker, could go late in the second round. That seems a little bit early for me, but um, I would probably say, you know, obviously Fields. You know, I don't know what's up with Wyatt Davis, and frankly, I haven't done a lot of, you know, I know he was considered like a late first rounder a year ago, right? Um, I yeah, he, I think Pete Warner's got a chance, I guess is the, the best way to say center's got a chance. Ohio State, quietly, we can talk about DBU, we can talk about D-line U, um, we can talk about wide receiver U. But quietly, if you look around the NFL, there are a lot of Ohio State linemen. Yeah, like you know, it's no longer like Ohio State used to be, in my opinion. And that goes way to, back, way back. Yeah, oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You used to say about Ohio State like little Charles Bentley, or you know, like it was this one guy, right? Every draft class had like one guy at Ohio State that became a guy. You had the pancake guy that went to the Rams and from from Sandusky, Orlando Pace. Like there was always one. You had the guy. You had um, a man that was with Robert Smith, who passed Corey Stringer. Like, there was always one. But Ohio State's doing a great job of putting two or three offensive linemen in the NFL. And they may not get drafted high, but they make the teams and stick. And, and, like, there's no big deal to see an Ohio State lineman playing for the Giants, playing for the Carolina Panthers, playing for – like, they're out there. And I would say they quietly have probably two or three offensive linemen that will get drafted again this year too. Andrew Norwell went undrafted to $55 million guaranteed. Yeah. Great. That's right. Yeah. Cincinnati Anderson was a school that he played at. Yeah, so, yeah, um, like I said, I, I just – you know, I haven't studied – first day offensive lineman um, in this draft because that's not where the Browns are going. So I, I don't know where Davis and or Myers will go, but um, that, that is, that is an interesting question. I just can't believe you said first buck. I like just right. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's uh, let's talk Sean way quickly. Okay. Um, he did not have a great senior year. We all, me included, we all questioned why he came back. We all questioned, you know, after his dad was on TV going back and forth and I can't think of her name, and I'm not trying to. Lindsay Jones, Lindsay I Jones. think, is a writer for the Athletic. Yeah. Um, she did a good article about when he showed up for his pro day, all the injuries he'd been dealing with. He cut off his dreads. Um, I conti- even when I was putting him down this season, and he was getting roasted by Indiana, and he was getting roasted by Clemson. The one thing I did stand by was the one good thing Sean Wade has in his back pocket is he has tape from 2019 of him being an elite third corner in the and being a third corner is nothing wrong with it as i look if you listen to a to z and and i kept saying i go everybody was like oh sean wade's losing all this money and i kept saying buster screen he can at, at worst he can be buster screen in the nfl in my opinion zach yeah now well, I look, read the arc. go ahead he's big and fast um mm-hmm. and he can play any position now sometimes if they don't think you can play one there's an issue yeah. you know for for a guy to stick but yeah, I mean, as long as Sean Wade's going to check out healthy and, and be willing to do the work, I mean, that's a guy that, say he ends up with a fourth or fifth round grade, that's a guy that defensive coordinators and position coaches are going to fight for a round ahead, right? right? Saying, like, we just, there's not many guys this this big and fast. Like, and let, you can blame on special teams. There's multiple things he can do. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, like, you know, there are exceptions to, to every rule, and teams have their different line of thought. But, like, what in the Steelers' history says that they're going to draft a running back in the first round, right? Nothing. Like they're going to take no. offensive line. And I just think, hey. you know, most years the smarter teams draft at the end of the first round. And I just think, you know, how did the Browns get good? Well, the offensive line was a big part of it. You know, right. Saints have been good for a long time. And, yes, we know they're superstars, but they've, been, they've had a damn good offensive line for a long time. Right, yeah, you take and, a lot of Ohio State Buckeyes too. Yeah, by the way. and and you look at um, corners and safeties and just mm-hmm. you know how much those guys are getting paid and how much they meet and so many of them that you need. I, I just keep saying this, guys. Don't tell me that Denzel Ward is injury prone because he's missed two games a year. Right, they are the smallest guys on the field and they are in high speed collisions on seventy percent of the plays over a sixteen game season. Right? right, like there's not many guys on the planet that can do what Denzel Ward can do. And so, not that you can draft the next Enzo Ward, especially outside the top 15 of the draft, but, like, you draft – smart teams draft those guys. And <laughs> let me say it. Let me just put it this way. Name me, name me five cornerbacks that play 16 games a season, and I'll okay. give you 20 bucks. There's just not <laughs> many of them. 
It's right. not many. All right, let's move on. We got to move up quickly, but we appreciate these. I'm going to go through a couple more, about three or four more. Um, this is from Matthew Ruskin. He always tweets us. Good dude. He was in town a couple weeks ago, and he tweeted us and told us that he went to Swenson's and he went to Honeymoon Grill. Um, we love and appreciate you, Matt, that you uh, that you obviously listen to the podcast, and you obviously know how we like to get fat. Um, he says, hey, Dre, guys, I hope the second shot is treating you well. Well, if you listen to the podcast, you know that we're alive, but it almost kicked our ass. A question for the draft-centric A to Z. Who is your favorite player the Browns shouldn't draft? Thanks. Shouldn't draft. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think probably the most ready pass rusher is Jalen Phillips from Miami. Mm -hmm. He had three concussions, was forced to medically retire. He transferred. He had some other injury issues. And I think there's a something off the field in there, too. Um, I don't know... I can't think of what it is, but I would just say this. When it comes to um, the combine, you know, not only guys, you know, is there medical testing done by every team's doctor and you get that in a normal year, but there's weed testing too. And I thought um, weed's legal now. Right. Teams <laughs> don't care if you smoke. Right. The drug test is an intelligence test. Yes, sir. So I'm not talking about Jalen Phillips. I'm just saying in general, like, you know, when there's knocks on guys, there's there's knocks and teams say, "What what are you doing?" <laughs> right. So that's the guy that I would say. Not you know not that I don't want, that, but I just don't see the guy the Browns taking a guy with three concussions. Now when Caleb Farley and two back surgeries playing corner, I you know I, I don't know. I, how do you interpret that info? I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. all medical and background info, teams interpret differently. It's and all like, gamble. They're all gamble. Yeah, they're all a gamble. Right. We, we've said. If there was such thing as safe picks in this draft, there would be a whole lot more hits. Right, right. right. All right, let me get, on, get us to a next one because I'm going to try to run through a bunch. Hey, hey, Dre, you asked for some draft-related DMs on the last A to Z. I'd be curious to hear what Zach thinks the chances are the Browns move up in the draft to get one of the top DBs, say someone like Horn, Sertain, Samuel, or my pick Newsom. I know it goes against what we think of with this front office, but I think – but I feel there are one more impact player away on defense, and I don't think this year's edge class would be worth the trade up. Thanks for keep, for, thanks, keep doing your thing on A to Z and the Tribes broadcast. Yeah, a great question. And like, if they have to move up to twenty two or twenty three and get a corner, I don't think that's a significant move up. I think that's a really solid move. I mean, why do you yeah. acquire extra thirds and fourths so you can go get a guy you really want if you have exactly. to do it, right? I mean. The only big move up I could see is possible, and I see this as like 10% possible, is the Vikings sit at 14. They don't have a second-round pick. They don't have a glaring need. Like, they're probably going to take – you know, they're not great, but they're in, their roster's pretty set. Like, they're going to take the best offensive lineman or the best edge rusher, right, whoever falls right. at them at 14. So, if, if the guy they really want is gone, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. So – I, I, I could see the Browns absolutely. As a matter of fact, I would say that goes at the top of the list of any scenario is if they need to move up to 20 or to 23 and go do it. But, like, a big move, 10 or more spots up the board where you're giving up future capital, uh, I'd, I'd be surprised, and I think it would have to take a guy they really love dropping. I think it would come totally out of, out of nowhere, yeah. totally unforeseen. I like the Vikings one. You've obviously looked at this because that would fit. And there's some ties to the Vikings and you may like, so I, I didn't think they could trade. You made me think just by saying that, that the Vikings thing is possible. So let that, that's a good one to keep in your back pocket. Come Thursday night, guys. All right. Here's from Topher. He says, Andre, big fan of your show's work and Zach's okay too. Which pass rusher in this draft would you say is like the Cadillac, the black man's dream? And which one is just the <laughs> <EMW>? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, should, I guess I should have pre-read some of these. <laughs> um, I think Quiddy Pay is going to be the first one to go. I, my read on him is that they asked him to do too much at Michigan. They never really just like let him rush. But you know, I think now my concern with him would be that really good edge rushers never make it out of the top ten, right? And he just happens to be the best of kind of a. A down group. The rest of them have questions. I mentioned Phillips, who's who's great and looks the part, but has the concussions. And Rousseau, who had 15 and a half sacks in one year and only played one year. Um, the kid from Georgia is super explosive. He is not a defensive end. He's like 240 pounds. So he does he fit the Browns? I don't know. 
Is he a three, four outside backer? Yeah, which is he's probably more of a three, four outside backer. Um, Tryon from Washington absolutely looks like he was sculpted in a factory, you know, one year of production. So, yeah, um, I think Quiddy is – I'll be surprised if Quiddy doesn't go first. But like I said, when you talk about the injuries with Phillips and, and then I guess Peter King reported that Ojolari, the Georgia kid we were just talking about, has an injury issue. Um, you had the Rousseau had a bad pro day after only playing one year. Like, I don't know how this is going to go. I, 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 I put Rousseau and Tryon on the Browns list, but really the only thing I'm, I'm fairly certain of is that Quiddy pay goes first. Nice. All right. Let's Chris Kenny who always talks to us. Love uh, getting uh, DMS from him. This is the most DMS I've ever gotten from straight men. This has uh, been something else that I guess, I guess we'll do it. It's working. Uh, this is a good one. Draft question for the pod. When drafting Owen Marincic, did the front office actually expect him to play both ways? <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. Um, but it made for a good draft story. Listen, when Saturday rolls around on the draft, everybody needs something to talk about, right? It's just three days is too long. It's right. just too freaking long. So I hope the weather cooperates, and I hope that you guys that are going, quote, on Friday and Saturday actually get some enjoyment out of it. I know, you know, hopefully Cleveland gets back in the rotation for a full draft, but – Man, everybody, by the time Saturday rolls around, everybody's dragging ass, and it's it's ready to move along. Yes. Do you hear me right now? Yeah. All right. Uh, quickly, Cole Payne says he was uh, loves listening to podcasts, was wondering. You kind of answered this already. Uh, the possibility of the Browns moving up. I think you kind of already said uh, what you think about that and where they could possibly do it. So you don't have to really go through that one again. I want to get – there's a couple there. I mean, we literally have – we had about five more minutes at the most, and let me I'm going to try to run through and see if we got one more decent one. This, I mean, this one can't be a bad one. It's from Willie Mays Hayes. Uh, he says, draft question for UNC. Who is a Browns draft pick that you've been the most excited about at the time but was ultimately disappointing? Oh, wow. Mm. This is a long list. Um, yeah. I don't think you can call Peppers disappointing. I think he was starting to play really well when they moved on him. Right? Peppers is a player. They just – it goes back to our conversation about – and I think this has been part of the issue with the Browns. Um, as I'm looking at your book, 100, 100 Things Browns Fans Should Know <laughs> and Do Before They Die, this is literally sitting in front of me. A lot of these guys have been put in situations they couldn't overcome, right? Right. right. Um, um, but in saying that, <laughs> go ahead, you answer. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, this list, this is a tough list, right? Right. Who do I think? I would say Braylon Edwards, and I'm not saying it in a in a not just dis- see, and it's not all Braylon's fault either. The offense was so messed. Like I, I feel like anybody I can say I can make the excuse on the other side that they had. Well, no Bradley Poole got a concussion on his very first play of his first very play. first preseason game and never had a career. Right, right. right. And um, I loved and I loved everything that he was about. Right, he was a big, fast dude, that, and like 20 years old. Right. That could play really any position, and he never really got to get his career started to see how it could go. Same with Sean Jones, who gets hurt on the last OTA. It was right. Yeah, um, that's right. We know that's who else was point. in that. Look, look. Uh, I, I'm not going to speak for the last four years because I think Nick Chubb changes that. Kellen Winslow is the most talented player I ever saw come to that building. And no doubt. No doubt. We don't. We not only know now, but we know what, how his career went. And I'll just leave it. No there. doubt. Yeah. And you know what, Kellen? You know what, Kellen's twofold. And this is hard. It's it, Kellen is the answer because of the talent ability that he came into, that he came with, because of the injuries and how he attained most of the injuries, and because you gave up a second round pick and you could have had Ben Roethlisberger. Right. That answers the question. Yeah. All right. Last about, one. Like all these years later, seventeen years later, nine coaching staffs, three owners later, you still rue that pick. Yeah, that's the answer. It's mo- as difficult as yeah. it is. This all is right. Two things to sum it up. Oh, give me a last one. Let me give you, I'm going to give you one more. Okay. Give, I like this one from Jim R., Jim Jr. Um, question for the pod. Any chance there is one team within the division the Browns are focused on when it comes to the draft this year? If so, which team would that be? I assume the Ravens, but Burrow is here to stay, and the Steelers are always competing. Thanks again. I'll hang up and listen. Yeah, Jim, I, I like that question, and I do think, and we've talked about this before, I do think the Browns have arrived at the point that they can make decisions based upon we need to beat the Ravens, Right. Um, that being said, they still have to block T.J. Watt for years to come. Um, and however the Steelers solve this quarterback situation a month from now, a year from now, or four years from now, nobody drafts receivers like the Steelers. And, you know, everybody's down on Chase Claypool now because he's an idiot, but, like, he's a big, fast freak, and he's played one year. 
right? Deontay Johnson, the Steelers get him out of Toledo. He's freaking really good, right? Um, and the fact that the Bengals could add Jamar Chase to that or they could actually try to get a tackle that could block that could give Joe Burrow a chance with what's already a pretty decent receiving core. So, yeah, no, I think – you have conversations about all your division rivals and how you match up and how you have, because that, that is a third of your schedule and that's your ticket to getting in the tournament. But, you know, I think when we sit here and talk about matching up with the Ravens, I I think that that's real, but I don't think it's significant. I think the Browns make decisions on their own evaluations, uh, on their own opportunities and what they see for the betterment of them, boy, more than they say, boy, we, we better, Scrap our draft plan and, and focus on these three guys because they can help us beat Lamar Jackson. Right. I mean, and that's what it comes back to. Right? Yeah. Guys, we appreciate all these questions. This really was awesome. We'll do it again. We'll continue doing stuff like this. Um, if you can, you guys can be adults with the with the messages. By the way, let me know what's modern. I'm still getting tweets about it's from security guards talking about left eye Lopez. I think I'm going to listen to TLC on the way to the Cavs Indians game today. <laughs> All right. So a couple quick thoughts as we get out of here. Um, you know, it's probably not this year for the Browns, but like the draft, it can shape the history of your franchise, right? In good or bad fashion. You would think based on the state of things with the Browns, that this isn't the draft, but you never know when you're going to acquire that next player, right? Or obviously for, for, the better part of 20 years when you're going to colossally fuck up and really set you back. <laughs> um, Jerry mentioned my book and that, that brings up um, in the book as has been told on this pod and has been told on many radio stations, the famous Justin Gilbert pro day story mm. and how half the league had him off the board and the Browns drafted him in the first round behind, uh, <clears throat> you know, despite the head coach never having met him. Right. Well, I heard another one the other day uh, while Justin Gilbert was with the Browns um, female, a uh, friend of a friend had gone to uh, a bar with friends to, to watch the Browns game. And they were all dressed in their Browns gear and took a picture as the game started. And she was wearing her Justin Gilbert Jersey and she tagged him and she posted it on Instagram. Hey, you, you know, if you're around, we're at such and such bar watching the Browns and celebrating at halftime of the game, Justin Gilbert liked the post. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my man was worried about the wrong stuff at the wrong time. Oh man, it goes down in the DMs. <laughs> yes, it does. But with A to Z, it's just all about the draft. <laughs> all right, shout out honeymoon, shout out scene, shout out American fireworks, shout out to you guys. Thanks for listening. Um, maybe this weekend because of the draft, but I, I really think it's going to be a quiet um, more more than it's going to be like really outrageous but we'll see because at 26 we don't really know we'll keep guessing thanks for listening talk to you guys soon see ya